It's our first event of 2019, and it's wonderful to have Smita here. Uh, thanks for coming. I know it was very short notice. We just announced it two days ago, so it's lovely to have you all here. Uh, Smita, I've known Smita now for, I think, 14, 15 years. It's been a long time. Uh, and uh, we were at, at Berkeley at the same time, and uh, we've been friends for since then. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to briefly, it's, it's not a very brief introduction, but it's an Don't read the whole, you don't have to, you know. <laughs> and, but I'm going to do it. And um, let me start, yeah. Uh, so Smita Radhakrishnan is the Associate Professor of Women's Studies and Associate Professor of Sociology at Wellesley College in Boston, just outside Boston. She's interested in gender, finance, and, the develop and development in India and race, class, and gender in the US. As a feminist ethnographer of gender and globalization, Smita's scholarship strives to illuminate how the local and the global reflect and challenge one another. In her teaching, she aims for her students to ascertain that complex, dazzling set of dynamic interconnections. In the two major research, work, research projects that have defined her scholarship, she, uh, she's, she so far, that, has that have defined her scholarship so far. She has examined the institutional context of work, finance, and international development in the geographical context of, context of urban India, the US, and South Africa, always with a focus on individual subjectivities and experiences. As a result of these engagements, both her research and teaching engage in interconnected legacies of colonialism and slavery. She highlights how these histories are often, in, often re-inscribed through contemporary forms of inequality. Smitha's me methodolo methodolo methodological preference for fine-grained ethnography and interviews and the theoretical bent towards the world's, towards the world's systemic di dynamics of the economy and cultural link and cultural link at every turn the individual personal with the public, the social, and the political. Currently, she's working on a, on a book man manuscript that examines for-profit microfinance in India. Her first book, Appropriately Indian, Gender and Culture in a Transnational Class, was a, mul was a multi-sided ethnographic examination of transnational Indian information technology workers, <coughs> IT workers. Her research showed that gender arrangements within educated, upwardly mobile IT families give this elite group disproportionate power in defining what it means to be Indian in the global economy. Prior to this book, she studied the cultural politics of post-apartheid South Africa, based on extensive research with South African Indian communities in Durban and its surrounding townships. At Wellesley Smitha teaches courses that examine globalization, race, gender, and diaspora studies, among other topics. In 2014, she taught, uh, she created these uh, online courses called MOOCs, uh, or is it MOOCs? MOOCs. <laughs> it's an abbreviation, so it doesn't matter, I guess. Uh, and it was released in 2016 in three modules. Uh, you can watch them online, and they've been hugely popular online. Uh, global sociology, global inequality, and global social change. When she is not teaching or writing, Smita performs and promotes classical and contemporary Indian dance forms, especially Bharatnatyam. She has been a long-term member of Navrasa Dance Theatre and continues to dance with them and serves on their board. In her free time, she, being so passionate about dance, she established Natya Dance Studio in Natick, where she lives, through which, which she offers weekly classes for children and adults and performs locally. And she's got two young kids who <laughs> keep her busy when she's not doing other things. <laughs> Thanks, Vita, for coming and sharing your work with us. Thank you, Kashu. <laughs> the clicker right here. Okay, thank you to all of you to come out for coming out on a Tuesday night um, and bear, you know, 
braving the traffic and the short notice to be here. Looking forward to a fun discussion with all of you. Um, this talk is an effort to put together kind of two of my big research projects, one on gender and IT and one on microfinance, and kind of put them within a shared frame. Um, although my research touches upon other, India, other areas, this is very much an India talk. Um, so I look forward to your feedback and, uh, and the discussion that we're going to have. And because of the size of the crowd, I hope that we can have lots of interaction. Okay, so um, the title of the talk is Rethinking Empowerment, Gendered Work in India's Polarized Service Economy. But I want to start out by asking all of you, what in 2019 does women's empowerment mean to you? What comes to mind? What are the connotations that you have? Uh, there are some uh, people who are a little exhausted by the topic, is anyone just sort of tired of hearing about it? Just a little bit, you can be honest. No one, no one's tired of no, it? I mean, uh, it's, it's like kind of, it's not so easy to interpret, you know. I mean, yes. More, more, not much of a common type. Like, okay. It's not much of a? The common type that we can, you know, just at like one. Yeah. So you, you kind of hear it a lot, but maybe we're not quite sure what it means. Maybe it's kind of, you know, dips in and out of the public sphere, um, right? So it's this kind of like uh, ill-defined thing that everyone says that they want, maybe. What are some other associations, whether positive, negative? Me too. Me too, okay. So the Me Too movement kind of brought this notion of empowerment um, back into the public sphere where maybe it had been hidden for some time, right? And so, and specifically on issues of gendered violence and harassment. Um, what else? What other associations do you have? Art, Positive, huh? Art, the ha way art has changed the perspective of women. Like, if yeah. either of them, like if she chooses motherhood, we'll also question that, that is that empowerment? And if she chooses a job, we question it. And now we do not know. So ultimately, it's if she wants to do whatever she has to do. Okay, that's a great point, right? So especially between work and, and, and home, right? This kind of division. Um, we're gonna talk, I'm gonna talk a lot about that, but I've been thinking about that a lot, you know, like my whole career. Um, right, but in some way we've kind of resolved it to say, oh, well, women's empowerment means women just have choices. So if they have choices to do whatever they want, well, then that's empowerment, right? So that's maybe one interpretation. Anything else? What else? Equal pay for equal work, thank you, right? So maybe um, we, we're doing the same job that women and men should be remunerated in the same way, right? Both in the US and in India, we are far, far away from being able to realize that part of empowerment. And I'm glad that you mentioned that because I'm gonna talk, be talking more on that side of things. Um, often, you know, we think about other kinds of um, political things, right? So, you know, um, voting rights, right? Um, full participation in political process. Uh, maybe mobility. Um, there's some anxiety about empowerment, right? Maybe if women become very empowered, then men lose out, or maybe men feel a little bit less powerful. There's certainly backlashes against it, right? Or have people kind of heard about that, or does that seem like something feasible that there would be, you know, a little bit of a backlash um, from men and even some women, right? There's something maybe destabilizing about it, right? So, so this concept, um, right, has uh, it's a buzzword. Right? It's overused, and yet it's quite ill-defined. And I think in 2019, even though the concept has been around for about three to four decades, um, we don't really, uh, it's kind of become a stand-in for everything to do with women's rights, and we haven't really examined it very, very clearly or don't have a clear sense of it, and it can be very contradictory as well. Um, so in this talk, I'm hoping to kind of delve into it and rethink it a little bit with attention to the Indian context, um, but then, you know, hopefully we can broaden out from there depending on how much time we have. So let's think, I want to just review briefly what women's empowerment has looked like in India, very specifically. And I'm talking here from the early days when the term became used in policy settings and in social movements. So really it was the social movements that brought the term into uh, wide usage, right? So I'm talking about leftist movements, Dalit movements, peasant, peasant movements, women's movements, you know, all kinds of social movements um, starting in the 1970s used the idea of empowerment, particularly women's empowerment, to mean that right, the perspectives of marginalized folks, folks who are not powerful in society, should come to the center and influence the status quo. Right, so that that whole social movement's perspective was really coming out of you know a critique or uh, a critique of modernization in contemporary India. Right, not going as planned, not really maybe alleviating poverty or inequality. Right, by the 70s, that type of crisis was there, and so there was a lot of social um, movement. 
movements that were uh, pushing back against this. Also, in the same time, right, NGOs start adopting that kind of critical perspective, right, and um, take up the, the notion of empowerment, in particular women's empowerment in a big way, and start using that to drive their own agendas. And this is happening all over the country. And around the same time, right, and this, this is happening not just in India, but in other parts of the world as well. So at the same time, um, you have INGOs, right, IG, I like the World Bank, right, other big international organizations that start crafting more hegemonic more dominant, more powerful programs that are coming from the outside and encouraging places like India, various countries in Latin America, in uh, different parts of Africa, right, to craft programs that are geared towards women's empowerment. So suddenly you see all these different actors, some of them not so powerful, some of them very powerful, that are all pushing the same agenda, right? And so that term, which was supposed to be about critiquing, ends up being promoting something that, that seems like it has a lot more power behind it. Could be good, could be bad, right? Finally, starting in the 1980s, the Indian government itself at various level starts taking up empowerment as an official thing that it does. So the anthropologist Aradhana Sharma, who's written this uh, brilliant book, Logics of Empowerment, it's, a, it's a, about 10 years old now, but I still think very highly relevant. She studied, uh, did an in-depth ethnography of the Mahila Samakya program, which some of you may have heard about. Right, so she dates the, the, the start of kind of official state-led women's empowerment to about 1984. In Rajasthan, there was something called the Women's Development Program that got going at that time and Maila Samakya and other state-led programs kind of came out of that, right? So um, we ha that's how long, at, at least, right, the recent history of women's empowerment in India kind of, you know, all of these different players have been a part of it. And certainly this and many other uh, kinds of activism have produced a number of really positive changes in India that we can see, right? We see a lot more women in political office and in public life, and this has to do with political changes, legal changes as well, um, mandating the presence of women in large numbers in India. Um, and then, you know, today, back to the, the Me Too, um, you know, shout out, we have greater awareness, particularly of various forms of gendered violence in India, you know, more visibility of women speaking out against all of these things, right? So all of these things are unmistakably uh, important advancements, right, and have furthered our discourse and our understanding of, uh, of women, right, and, and how what women sort of taking their full place in society, right, but there's been a silence in all of that, and that has to do with work, women's in the, women in the workforce, right, so some of you might be um, familiar with this kind of disturbing graph, right, so this graph is from uh, the world, it's really from NSSO data, um, National Statistical Survey data, and it traces women's uh, labor workforce participation from 1990 to 2016. So it's actually the same time period that you have the growth of these um, empowerment programs and a few other things that I'll talk about in a second, right? And then you see this historic low coming in 2012, pick, picking up a little bit. Today in 2017, we're at about 27.1%, which is 163rd in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, for context, Rwanda is at the top at about 84%. Yemen is at the bottom at about 6 So 27% is, is pretty low by global standards. Um, and, you know, raises some questions about, you know, what, what's going on in India, right? There's been so much success, so much, uh, you know, expansion of our thinking about women's empowerment. And yet, you know, this is what's going on in the workforce. How can we um, start to think about that? So, sure, yeah. So that is what percentage of women who are available in the workforce are actually engaged in paid work. So it includes informal work. It includes the in informal workers as well. So anyone who is employed earning money. So it, it does include informal workers. Um, so it's percentage of women who are involved in the workforce. Uh, and, and, there's, and, it, and it can be, um, even if it's part-time, it's not necessarily just full-time work. It's not necessarily formal work. Um, so if you think about how broad that is, it's really quite uh, surprising. And it's actually much lower in urban areas than in rural. Um, but there have been demographers who have written about this in more detail explaining it. And it seems that um, a lot of what can explain this are ch tr transformations in the rural sector. Um, which I'm not touching upon explicitly. So, but there's a larger context for this, and I'm not a demographer, so I won't get into the quant part of it, but it's a relevant question for thinking about, you know, what exactly are we looking at here? 
So another context which is really important to think about during this period is the rise of the service economy, right? So what do I mean when I talk about the service economy? I'm talking about an economy that is largely driven by services rather than the making of stuff, manufacturing, rather than agriculture. Right now, um, in the U.S., this transformation has been very clear and very pronounced and very dramatic and very well documented. We went in the U.S. from an economy where most jobs were like this, right, and the middle class could have a stable career working in manufacturing, um, to an economy that is quite different, right, dominated at the top by tech and finance, particularly um, to a lesser extent, you know, healthcare. Um, and you know other kinds of sort of tech jobs. These jobs require right high levels of education, high levels of professional credentialing um, are not uh, available to everyone. Right, it's difficult to br break into these careers. And on the other end, right, a huge expansion in very low wage feminized service work, right? Retail sector, also a huge expansion in personal services, things like that. Now, India is not the same, obviously, right? I mean, we have a lot of agriculture in India. We have a lot of uh, manufacturing in India that's very important. But we have still had this dramatic rise in the service sector, which is polarized, right? So you have in India, right, um, tech and finance jobs uh, kind of fueling the, uh, the upper end of the economy, right? Lots of wealth at the top. Very hard to, uh, you know, you need a lot of credentials to break into that in a big way. Um, and then at the bottom, right, an expansion of feminized work, everything from, you know, domestic work and various kinds of personal services to, you know, things like retail. So as in the U.S., the lower end, there's not lots of opportunities for advancement necessarily. Um, there are lots of those kinds of jobs, but they're not necessarily going to be producing, right, long-term um, advancement, long-term careers, right? So, you know, despite the differences in the U.S. and India context, I think it's safe to say that we do have an expanding um, and a dramatically visible service economy in India, and one that deserves thinking about through a gendered lens. Now, in the Indian context, this same transformation has had a set of promises, I would say, for what they would bring women, right? So the tech sector, right, was supposed to bring, especially middle class women, new opportunities in terms of advancement, right? It's a clean workplace. You could go there and be safe, right? And, and this is still the kind of um, thinking that pushes a lot of families to encourage their daughters to study engineering, right? You can go into IT. Um, it's a good job. You'll get a good income. Um, you'll be safe in an air-conditioned, clean workplace, right? These are all things you can have professional advancement within that. So it seemed to offer new opportunities for women who had conventionally been quite uh, restricted to uh, their domestic roles. And at the bottom, the expansion of microfinance in particular promised that working-class women, women at the bottom, would also have um, expanded opportunities um, in the form of microenterprises, right? That they would start their own small businesses, um, you know, lift their families out of poverty, et cetera. So now I want to look a little bit at my research in both these areas and share some of the trends uh, at kind of at the bot top end and then at the lower end and see if we can look at uh, the comparisons between them. All right, so um, what I'm going to argue is that both of, in both of these um, sectors, right, that women's empowerment in the service economy, had, in a polarized service economy, has been shortchanged because both at the upper end and at the lower end, women's unpaid and underpaid domestic roles are reinforced uh, at both ends, undermining women's positions in the workforce and compromising anything like women's empowerment that we might say, right? And so I want to talk about exactly what that looks like. Okay, when I started doing this research in the early 2000s, there was a spate of insane images, right, that really spelled out the fantasy of Indian women entering the IT workforce, right? So this is a cover story by Daniel Pink uh, at Wired Magazine, a very popular US-based magazine in 2005. I spotted it like standing in line for the gro you know, grocery store. Um, and this woman uh, is featured in the article. Through coincidence, I ended up being able to meet her and interview her for my research, right? Uh, this is another image, right, uh, that uh, came out in 2006. Uh, so, you know, what you see in common with both of these, right, is not only a fantasy of women's advancement, right, women doing very well in the sector and realizing themselves, but also the idea that if women are doing well, then India is also doing well, right? It's about India's advancement to a global stage. Um, so, you know, all of these images really embody that, right? 
But the reality is that women at that time, and uh, said, evidence suggests continue, to face a sex-segregated industry. So what do I mean by a sex-segregated industry? When we think of IT as a whole, right, that characterization really conceals all the different sectors of the industry. And within the industry, some work is considered women's work and other work is considered men's work. So if we look at human resources, technical writing, um, quality, and quality assurance work, all of those kinds of work are uh, paid a little less less opportunities for advancement, right, and are dominated by women. Whereas product development work, management, strategic thinking, all of those areas dominated by men, right, and are considered much more valuable to the firm. And I can give you some more detailed statistics about how that looks like um, in different companies. Um, to date, there has been very little written about that. When we talk about women's advancement in IT, there's always just sort of a summary of how many people are entering the industry. And at this point, it's about 51% of uh, new recruits are women. When I did the research, people said 50%, so it hasn't changed very much. I just looked at the data, and it's 51 now. Um, but at the, it's a very leaky pipeline, right? So you get to the top, and you're in the single digits. So something is happening along the way. It's not about recruitment. There's something going on within it. But the problem is much more, uh, is, is much deeper than that. Because in that process of advancement, even the women who say are sorted into less valued parts of that industry. Right? So despite this promise of advancement, right, women who enter the industry face surprisingly low odds of long-term advancement, right, for various reasons. Cultures within the workplace as well as cultures outside of the workplace, pushing them in both directions in ways that end up not being amenable to their advancement. Um, one of the key findings of my research is that women um, in these positions are still very much expected both by their workplaces and by their families and communities to put their families before their careers, which includes migration, which is still male-led, largely, right? So, um, and a shout out, there's a recent book written by um, Amy Butt called High Tech Housewives that looks at the structure of H-1B migration to the U.S., right? And even that visa structure requires a breadwinning man and a housekeeping woman, right? There has to be one main worker and one person who's not going to work in order to even get that visa going, right? So women end up planning out their careers in a way that they will, if they want to get married, take a back seat to their husband's career. They plan that from the outset. They expect it, right? And then therefore, uh, and then they may encounter some dilemmas later, right? But they're already setting themselves up for, um, you know, low odds of actually advancing within the workplace, right? So, um, and then the other point to, to add is that, you know, women are not the only, one of the, you know, major things to think about is that when we think about uh, women in the workplace, we also have men are part of the picture too, right? And so IT men very much want to marry women who work in IT, but they are very clear that those wives should not take their, their jobs too seriously, that they should be willing to pick up and move if they have a job and they should be willing to give up their careers if they have children, right? So, so, so all of these things um, contribute to this notion that women end up getting socialized into from very early that they must always put their families first. So let's see what this looks like. Um, so I, I'm going to give you some names, but they're all pseudonyms. Uh, Gautami, a graphic designer, um, age 26 in Mumbai. Uh, so she's 26. She's not yet married when I meet her. And I'm asking her about her. She's a technical writer, and she's, oh, she's a graphic designer, sorry. Um, that's also another area that's quite dominated by women. Um, and I asked her, you know, so where do you see your career? Where do you see yourself in five years, ten years? You know, what, uh, how, does, what do you, how do you see your future? And she says, you know, around age 30, 35, 40, when you're rising up the ladder, I think I'd prefer to settle down with my family and my husband because ultimately it's your family for whom you're doing it. And if they're not happy, uh, it really doesn't make any difference and it's better that you spend time with them and make them happy rather than earning money and money and money and nothing else. Right? So here you see a kind of gendered logic of work where uh, making, uh, working is only about earning money and it's not okay for women to only want to earn money. Right? And she's figured all this out before she's even encountered any of the tough choices about marriage or motherhood and is articulating, to me, is it her choice perhaps, but she's also articulating a discourse uh, about morality, right? about what's expected to her, what it means for her to be a good woman and what she expects to do in her life in order to make that happen, right? Um, okay, on the other end, 
Right here is an example of myelinating a little further down in the workplace. This gives us a sense of what's it like within the workplace, right? So that's pressure outside that's being internalized. What about pressure from within? So she says about her workplace, I know they don't like it when a woman's in their face. So you've always got to tone down the way you say something. There's a special amount of feeling attached when a woman opens her mouth and is brazen. Uh, they expect you to be a little womanly, but I've never really seen any overtly sexist attitudes either. Our common thought is that women don't really want to be around, that they have many other things that keep them busy. Right? So she, again, hasn't had children yet, right? is climbing up the ladder, and is you know, sensing that there are certain ways she can talk, that there are certain ways she can be ambitious, and certain ways that she can't be. Right? Um, from the very beginning. So, okay, so that's what's going on among women who are in the pipeline. There are also on this side policymakers who are, you know, promoting gender diversity policies, let's say. I did this research kind of at the dawn of gender diversity policies. Um, and so I know now you were saying you're working actively in that field and they're much more common now. Um, but when I was working, you know, the, I was starting to interview some of these um, chief diversity officers, uh, those kinds of folks to get their um, thoughts. And so, and, and this strange thing happened, which is that a lot of diversity officers, a lot of um, program, program, um, leaders, program leaders who are really uh, in tasked with getting women to uh, be more engaged in the workplace throughout their careers, they end up oddly blaming the women for not making the right decision, right? So it goes back to this thing of women's empowerment just being all about choice, right? And that women should just make different choices. And the, if they don't make good choices, it's their fault, right? So she says, the problem with Indian women is that we've never been independent in our life, right? It's easy to frame policies. We have them all. You name it, one year sabbatical child care, child care sabbatical, part time, flexi time, daycare. But the major mindset that we need is only from the women. Most of the time they're confused. If they don't want to bring a change and participate in the activities that you create for them, then the change never happens. Right? So there's this way in which all the policies, and there's more to say about the policies, I can talk about them if folks want. Many of these policies were imported from Western, from American multinationals, and there's a sense in which there, there's an ambivalence, like we need the policies, it's not, I don't know if it works for India, right? And so there's a way in which they kind of blame the culture, blame the women, and say, yeah, we're just doing everything they can, they have to figure it out. Right? Very odd contradiction, right? That the very women who should be championing the you know, women to sort of stay engaged throughout end up turning it around in this way. And this was uh, something that I encountered quite a lot. Okay, so that's kind of a thumbnail sketch of the upper end. Let's turn our attention now to the lower end. So there's a, mic there's a fantasy about microfinance too, right? Many of you may have heard it. It goes something like this. A woman gets a loan, she starts a small business, she uh, makes a little more money, uh, maybe uh, makes her household solvent uh, because her drunken husband was messing it up, right? The kids go to school, everyone gets to be a little bit better off, and then development happens. How many people have heard this fantasy? A little bit, everyone, wow, more folks than had heard of women's empowerment. Okay, fantastic, right? So, so this indeed is a fantasy, right? Um, and uh, what I found in reality, and there's lots of literature that supports this, right, is that microfinance clients um, gain access to loans because of their status as mothers. And they gain access to those loans because they are better financial risks because they are in a family. Right? And all the research that I did, I only found one instance in which a woman who was not a mother was able to gain access to a loan. It is their position as mothers in families that gives them access to the loan because they are perceived as more stable and better financial risks. So let me give you some context for thinking about this. Who are microfinance clients? We think of them as magical entrepreneurs, folks who are going to take this loan and pull themselves up by the bootstraps. Right? Entrepreneurship, as it turns out, most of us middle class folks right, wouldn't want to be entrepreneurs ourselves because it's really hard work right, to rely entirely on your own earnings. And as it turns out, working class women, would, most of them would prefer not to do that either. They are domestic workers, factory workers, agricultural workers, and they rely upon a husband's wage, at least in theory. So in all the research that I did and when I observed things like document collection, Right? Um, women, if they're about to take that group loan, we always hear that it's a group collateral and they all back 
each other up. But when you they actually fill out the paperwork, they have to write their husband's name, they have to get their husband's permission, they have to put down their husband's income and his uh, wages, right? And that is like their guarantee, actually, right? So if they're not individually um, connected to a man's salary, that man might be useless and might not, I mean, maybe he's not always, right? I mean, that, that's also a stereotype. But, right, if, he, if she's not connected, she doesn't get the loan either, right? Um, so uh, they are using microfinance as one additional income source, one additional little strand within uh, their livelihood, right? Very few of them are entrepreneurs. Um, only the really savvy ones, the really risky ones, maybe ones who have already been entrepreneurial in the past, who are willing to um, deal with failure a lot, who are aware of multiple state schemes and are able to take advantage of all of them and piece them together. Those folks are entrepreneurial, right? And some of the ones who are most entrepreneurial are actually the ones who are a little better educated, have a little bit more support, can afford to fail and put that money back into another uh, business, right? It's not this kind of small scale fantasy, which if we examine more closely, it makes sense that that's probably going to be hard to do, right? It's a huge burden to take. From a 10,000 rupee loan, can you start a business that will sustain a family, right? Really difficult with a very high interest rate where you have to pay back every month, right? Um, so these are very tough terms. So what I, you know, draw from this and sort of the way it relates back to this talk is that access to these loans can end up actually trapping women in low wage work permanently. The pressure to pay back that loan at every two weeks or every month, right? Um, there's really not a lot of opportunity to build up a serious business or to do anything really, um, you know, transformingly significant. There's not, there aren't necessarily education loans for them to upgrade their skills. They're not really able to break out of that particular, you know, we think that somehow the loan will help them break out of a cycle, but there's not, there's very little opportunity um, to do so, right? And in some cases, it can even trap them in debt cycles where the taking and repaying of loans in itself becomes a kind of livelihood strategy, right? So you take loans from here, you pay them back over here, sell a couple of salaries, take, sell one more thing, right? So, and, and so let me give you an idea of what that that might look like. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on someone I'm calling Ambuja in Bangalore. She lives in Kabul by Rasandra, for some of you who might know Bangalore. It's a slum neighborhood. Um, she's also 26, same age as Gautami when I met her. She worked at a garment factory and uh, fell in love with another garment worker. They married against his family's wishes. Um, and uh, when I meet her, she has a toddler daughter. And she is very happy to share with me that she quit her job at the garment factory, which was probably not a great job. We can all agree, I'm sure it was a tough, a really tough job. Um, and she's taken two MFI loans, so two loans from microfinance institutions, both of them at quite high interest rates. And two is the maximum that you can take out without it uh, showing negatively on your credit record. Uh, and now all of, even in, within the microfinance industry, all of it is overseen by the credit bureau. Um, so she says, I can do work in the house and take care of the baby and I get money. This is better than garment work. I'm 100% happy. Oh, I forgot to mention, the business that she started with that loan is a sari business where she sells saris on installment, right? So she goes to the wholesale part of the city, right? Buys a bunch of saris, goes around the neighborhood and then sells, you know, a 600 rupee sari for a um, 1,000 rupee or whatever, 800, but you pay me 100 rupees a week, right? On an installment basis and then she makes up the difference. Now, if you do spend any amount of time in an urban slum, Every other woman has this business, right? And the likelihood of it succeeding and every one of them being profitable seems to be quite low, right? I mean, how many saris can everybody buy, right? Um, but she sees it as, you know, I want to expand my business rather than to go back to work. I want to improve. It's not forward to, possible to come forward in one single step. Today they give me 100 rupees, tomorrow if they give me 20 extra, that is sufficient, right? So she's actually seeing the loan as an income stream Right? And, and, and doesn't really have a plan to sort of expand the business and really have a sense of that, but is, you know, does, is happy to not go back to the garment job because she has very few options, right? And she's making the best of it. She's saying she's 100% happy, but what are the odds that this type of a strategy is going to lead to a long-term livelihood that provides more security or more benefits than that garment factory job that she left, right? So, right, loans can kind of lead to a kind of trap. Okay, 
So now, what is the context for this? How is this even possible? Um, the policymakers within microfinance actually um, are in, have a livelihood strategy that is not incompatible with the kinds of choices that Ambuja is making. So someone I'm calling Shankaran is a veteran microfinance policymaker. He has, uh, you know, he was with Nabard from the very, very earliest days of the self-help group, and you know, had been engaged. Uh, now sits on many boards of prominent commercial microfinance industries. Right, and he says, uh, if she, the microfinance, says, I've given the money to my husband, he's running his rickshaw because he requires the money, isn't that empowering gender? Look, finally, the food has to come to the table. The woman becomes functional for getting that done. She gains her space, her respect. Food comes to the table for everybody. What is the question that we've got to ask anyway? This is not a feminist agenda we are driving here. It's a livelihoods agenda. Both of them have a contribution to make, and the household feels it is better off comparatively. Right? So, What's great about Shankar, and he's thinking about the household, he wants both husband and wife to have a kind of stake in it, right? But nowhere in this conceptualization is the woman seen as having any possibility for paid work, any possibility for education or advancement, and the loan is seen as the only way that she can gain power, bargaining power within the household. Whereas lots of women want to work, can work, have opportunities in the workplace, and are not necessarily being supported um, within that. And the loans that are being offered are within this livelihoods frame, where women are mothers and home homemakers, and the microfinance, the loan, gives them a stake in the financial operations of the household, and that's it. Right? So these deeper structures of what kinds of opportunities do they have, have actually, they're not even a part of the policy making um, agenda. Now, similar to Padmini, whom we talked about at Datacom, within the microfinance space, there are also uh, program leaders who design empowerment programs that are designed to kind of um, train women to become better business people, better entrepreneurs, and so on, right? So I'm going to talk about one of them, Maya, who was a client education director at an organization I'll call Prosperity International. She ran a, a very successful uh, Shakti Shri uh, women's empowerment program. And uh, she was training women for whatever business that they happened to be doing. So it wasn't for a specific business, but it was about you know, learning to expand your business, learning to scale it, how do you think about your market, you know, it's sort of general business training uh, kind of stuff, right? And so she recalled an instance uh, where um, she was sitting with a group of 22 uh, entrepreneurs who had gathered, or 22 women who were in the group, and one of them had received a very large order from Saudi Arabia to embroider burqas, some 4,000 burqas. And the woman who had received the order was complaining that she couldn't find anyone to help her with this order, that she had asked all these people, nobody was helping her, and even the facilitator of the group was really having trouble getting any of these women to step up and say they were going to help with this. Right? And so Maya goes and looks through all the registration cards and finds that some of them had actually said that they're tailors and they do embroidery, and yet none of them had stepped forward. So she says, I just stood up and said, look, Husseina is asking for five tailors who can do embroidery for her. Why are you sitting quiet? You know, instantaneously, your empowerment, your motivation to just stand up and get that order for you. What made you keep quiet? She, this one of the women that she was talking to, uh, who, who had identified herself as a tailor, said, nothing great I'm doing. I thought, you know, why should I put that on paper? Why should I speak up? And then I realized, this is uh, Maya speaking again, you know, they're shy to disclose their identity as an entrepreneur, right? So she kind of, and she goes on at length, I just took a little segment of the quote, but she goes on to imply that, right, the reason that women are not taking up the opportunities that are being offered to them is because they're, you know, they're sort of too shy, they're not, they're not realizing their capacity, they're not good workers, they're not, we're offering them all this great stuff and they're just not taking it, right? But when I asked around, right, women don't really, they've figured out that embroidery is devalued work. Women in the same neighborhood knew they could work for embroidering a piece of clothing the whole day and hardly make 100 rupees, right? That the, whatever they made, if they tried to sell it, it would be bargained down even lower. And so there's plenty of good reasons to think the women in that group didn't necessarily think that embroidering all those burkas was going to be a good deal for them, right? Um, so there's a real, like, sense that among the people who are supposed to be empowering them, that there's a which that blame gets shifted to the women themselves rather than dealing with the conditions um, and the real situations that women are navigating within that. So another kind of interesting parallel in both places. Okay, so let's try to sum up a little bit and then I hope we can have a discussion. So the polarized service economy has left women behind at the upper end and at the lower end in very significant ways. Why? 
What I've tried to argue here is that in both sectors, the work of mothering continues to be unpaid or underpaid. Right? We don't really have any kind of recognition. We have a moral value for mothering without any type of transformation in the culture of the workplace or in the economic value of mothering. There's been no discussion of that. All of that has been left untouched. Right? That, so that's one, one thing. The second thing to consider is respectability politics. And this plays a significant role. Both at the top and at the bottom, women feel rewarded if they can remain in the workplace. They feel socially rewarded. Right? They feel that they are being more respectable, that they are being more true to being Indian or being good women in their community, whatever it is. And some may argue, oh, this is cultural, this can't change, this is intractable. But a lot of research has shown, and I would point to Naila Kabir's uh, classic research on Bangladeshi garment workers, has pointed out that these respectability politics are actually quite malleable. That when there are good opportunities for women, that norms around what women can do and can't do change. Right? That norms for respectability are more malleable. So you know, I, I push back against this argument that it's culture and respectability that prevents any kind of change. Right? I think there are other things that can be done. But we can talk about this, and maybe people have different opinions about this. And finally, there's been a, a, quite a bit of research that I can't take credit for that's out there in the literature that shows that although there's been a huge expansion in education opportunities for women's education, there hasn't been a proportionate expansion for moderately educated women who are kind of in the middle. Right? So they're really that, that, that expansion, that polarization, right? There's lots of opportunity at the top, lots of opportunities at the bottom, which are not that great. Both of them have the downside. There's not much in the middle, right? There's not many opportunities for moderately educated women to get you know, fair working conditions, some opportunity for advancement, something that would remunerate and value their labor, right? So all of these are things to kind of consider when we think about why women have been left behind in both places. Okay, so let's kind of come back to this big question of women's empowerment. Um, what I, I think the way that we have to rethink it, right, has to do with rethinking the gender divisions that structure paid and unpaid work, right? And what are those divisions, right? People might recognize these public, private, work, home, economy, family, right? Everything on the left, masculine or feminine? Masculine. masculine. Everything on the right, feminine, right? We have this str these strong binary divisions, right? Everything on the left, valued, worth money. Everything on the right, not so much, right? And yet without everything on the right, the left cannot be sustained, right? So these binaries continue the, to structure the way we think about what is valuable. And that has not been shaken in any of our discussions about women's empowerment, in any of our discussions about paid work, right? And I th in order, if we don't get to that, we're, we're compromising and shortchanging the very concept of women's empowerment. Um, in both uh, women's empowerment discourse and praxis has tended to overlook women of bo all class positions, but I've focused on kind of opposite ends, but I would argue all women's, all uh, class positions, equal access to the labor market. And that's something that, you know, a lot more work and thinking can be done about. Um, I thought I had one more there. Okay. So, um, you know, to conclude, I want to um, posit to, to all of you that thinking about individual or political empowerment of women is very powerful, and indeed we need it, but it's ultimately compromised without a full understanding, a full grappling with economic empowerment. And true economic empowerment, right, isn't about more gender policies, right, um, more loans for women, but really rethinking what is valued, what constitutes paid work, who gets to do that paid work, and what kind of opportunities are available within paid work. Without that equal stake, in the workforce and fair work that rewards education, women of all class backgrounds will only have a partial participation in society and in the economy at large. So I will stop there and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Sure.